you know what grace is, my friend? I, I'd say a, a good way to, to understand grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. But grace is not license. Liberty is not license. You know, grace comes, with grace comes responsibility. You know, we live in a world today that everybody wants to be free to do their own thing, right? And God loves freedom. God loves freedom. But God never gave man freedom without responsibility. You need to, you need to get that. Freedom doesn't mean that you just go out and do whatever you want with no consequences. See, that's what, that's what our world wants. That's what the lost man wants. He wants to be free to just sin. That's the problem. See, when people talk about they want to have freedom, it's the freedom to sin. When God sets you free, he sets you free to serve. Galatians 5, verse 13, Paul says, Use not your freedom as an occasion to the flesh like the lost people do, but by love serve one another. God set you free to serve him and, and others, okay? Now, what he says about profit, when you try to go under a performance-based acceptance system, Paul's going to say you're going to fall from grace. You know, grace puts you on the spot. Grace is freedom and liberty wrapped in responsibility. Grace says, I've already given you all the blessings in my son. Now, walk pleasing to me. And God, through Paul, instructs us how to walk pleasing to him. And grace, grace, doesn't, want, grace doesn't motivate my heart to want to go out and sin against God. Oh, no, no. He died for me. Grace motivates me because I know I don't have to fear about losing my salvation or losing the blessing. It motivates me to serve him out of a thankful heart. You know, Israel served God. They brought forth good works. The law can bring forth good works. But the motivation is different. See, when you perform, it's out of fear and dread. When Israel didn't perform up to God's word, he would curse them. Today, in Christ, Christ became a curse for us, Galatians 3 says, 3.13. And now you please God in his son. And all he wants you to do is rest in what he says to you through, from, through Paul, Romans, through Philemon. You rest in God's word. That's pleasing to him, okay? Well, he puts you on the spot. He says, now you bring forth fruits by listening to my apostle. Now, when he talks about being circumcised, Again, I, sh I said in Galatians 5, verse 2, that's today, it's not circumcision so much is the issue. But a big thing today, as big as it was in Paul's day with circumcision, is water baptism. You don't need to be water baptized today in order to be saved. You don't even need to be water baptized. Now, I know what they say. I, I, I come from that background. They say, well, although you don't need to be water baptized to be saved, and they mess around with Acts 2.38. I know what they do. They, don't, they say it doesn't mean for the remission of sins. It means because of remission. I understand they change God's word. But God says to Israel, Acts 2.38, they need it to be water baptized to be saved. You don't. You read Acts chapter 10, 44 down. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 down. And you're going to see a, a Gentile named Cornelius was saved by Almighty God before he was ever water baptized. That change happened because in Acts 9, Paul came on the scene, okay? So water baptism is not part of salvation. But then they say, well, it's an outward sign of an inward faith. You, you've heard that, right? And by the way, when somebody tells you that, you tell, show me in the Bible, because there's nowhere in the Bible where it says that water baptism is an outward sign of inward faith. No. If you really want to obey, yeah, you don't need to be water baptized to be saved, but if you really want to obey God and be in obedience, you ought to submit to water baptism. Not in the Bible. <clears throat> I know it's a tradition of men, but see, Paul says we need to listen to him, not men. Now watch this. Today, whether it's circumcision or water baptism, Paul's going to tell you something. <clears throat> Verse 2, Christ shall profit you nothing. What's going to happen is, Paul says, I testify. Now that word testify, we're going we're gonna to look, look at verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. You understand, when you go back here and take ordinances, now, now, now get this. When you go back here in the law of Moses as a believer, 
take ordinances that God gave that nation of Israel and put them on yourself, that yoke of bondage. God says, now you are a debtor to keep the whole law. Don't miss it. When you go and put yourself back under here, that's why Paul stands so hard on this, on this issue. When you go back here and say, God, I want to be justified by this stuff here. And by the way, that includes the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, and all those other things found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because those were the kingdom law. Those were laws. That's the law of that earthly kingdom. That, that's the same thing too. Over there in Matthew, the Lord says, If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Right? But you keep reading. He says, If you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Now think about that. In Israel, their forgiveness was based on whether they forgave others. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, and Colossians 3, 13, that our forgiveness of other people should be based on the fact we've already been forgiven. See that? That's grace. Law, grace. But when you go back here and put yourself under a... Let's use forgiveness, for example. You say, well, God... I know that you won't forgive me unless I forgive that person. Let's say you're not ready, physically ready, or, or, or actually emotionally ready to forgive a person. Because, see, forgiveness, there's a wound there that needs to be healed, just as any physical wound. Let's say you're not ready. And you know what? If you're, if you're believing these verses back here to the nation of Israel, performance, it will put a burden on your soul. You will be so emotionally traumatized thinking God wouldn't forgive you. I've heard people who believe that. I know the pain that they felt. Oh no, the grace message says, whether I forgive you or not, not the issue with God today. He wants me to forgive you, but even if I don't, I'm already forgiven. You see the motivation? See the difference? You see the freedom that that gives you in your Christian life? And you're so thankful that God deals with you based on what his son did that you'll forgive that person because he set you free. See that? No, look, let's look at it. Verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, you, you try to perform to please God. You do some type of outward performance. That's what that means. It's an outward fleshly performance. Christ shall profit you nothing. Now that term profit, that means something to give you an advantage. Jesus Christ died to give you an advantage. An advantage is how to live in this world. We live in a fallen creation. We live in a world that is, that is it's, it's, it's under the curse of sin. And God gives us power and freedom to live in this world. And it's through Christ. It's through what he did for us. He sets us free from the bonds of this world. He gives us an advantage. It's for our better, in our, to make us better. He gives us power. Look what he says in verse 3. Not only will Christ profit you nothing, Paul says, for I testify again. You know, that's interesting to me because Paul taught them all of this when he was there. Look what he says, I testify again. Now that word testify, that's a legal term used in courtrooms, isn't it? You know, when, when you go and testify in a courtroom, they put a Bible there. Isn't that interesting? They put a Bible, they say, raise your right hand and put your left hand on this Bible and say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And you say, I do. Well, that's what Paul is saying there, I'm telling you the truth that the moment you go back here and try to perform to please God and to perform to get the blessing, you're debtor to do the whole law. Think about that. He says you're going to fall from grace. We're going to see that. That word debtor, look what he says. Verse 3, for I testify again. Oh, Paul would tell these Galatians, man, I always have to keep reminding you. And, and, that, and that's how we are. You know why you should come to a, a place that rightly divides the word of truth? And we do this week after week after week until the rapture? Because in our flesh, we just have to be reminded over and over again about what God has done for us in Christ. That's fine. God knew that. That's why we preach week after week. And I want you to be with us. But he says, I testify again to every man that is circumcised. Today, you could say, Okay, you want to get water baptized? And that's supposed to be something that pleases God? Watch this. 
that he is a debtor to do the whole law. That word debtor means you owe God something. You say, God, I don't, want to, I don't want you to deal with me according to your son, Jesus Christ, and what he's doing today. I'm good enough to, you can deal with me based on performance-based acceptance. God says, okay, you got to do the whole thing. Now, I bet you don't know the Ten Commandments right off right now, do you? Can you rattle them off? Mm -mm. I know you can. Because people who tell me that they keep the Ten Commandments, they don't even know them right off. I got to give them two or three of them. No, you, you, can't, you can't keep his whole law. Well, look what Paul says in verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. See, Christ, he gives you no profit. He's become of no effect. The life of the Lord Jesus Christ that God desires to give you and have it work in you it won't work because you hinder it by saying, God, you hinder it by getting in the way. You know what the Christian life is? It's sitting down at a church or at home. When I say at home, in your own private study, you need to be with other saints who teach this and believe this. So that's why we exist. It's sitting down, hearing the message of grace preached by the Apostle Paul and believing it and allowing that to work. That pleases God. That, that'll do it. That, that's the Christian life right there. And that builds Christ in you. You build up sound Pauline doctrine in your soul. That builds Christ. Well, look what he says. He says, you're a debtor. You're obligated to fill the whole law. It's, it's, that, it's like being bound by an oath. Oh, my friend, back here in time past with Israel, a person will bound their soul with an oath to God. They'll make a vow, won't they? They say, Lord, I'm going to do this. And when they didn't fulfill it, it was their life, bound by an oath. That's what that is. You, you want to you wanna be before God based on your performance? He'll, he'll hold you to it. And you'll never, you'll never succeed. You'll fail every time. You know that because you fail. How many times you say, oh, God, I won't do, and then name the sin, whatever the sin is. And what happens? You might be all right for a day or two, right? Maybe a week. And you know what you do? You go right back into it, don't you? You know why? You don't have the power to. So stop, tell, stop telling God you won't do something and say, you know what I am going to do is I'm going to get into your word to me through the Apostle Paul and learn it and let that work in me. See that? That's how you do it. Now, I'm, I want you to see something. Go with me to James chapter 2. In the book of James, there's a principle about the law. James chapter 2. James, remember what we said. James speaks to the nation of Israel. That's future from us. And there's a principle about this law. James chapter 2, look at verse 10. In James 2, verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You see that? James says the same thing Paul says. He says, you know what? If you're going to... You can keep the whole law. You can go doing well, doing well, and then one day you offend. You, it means you sin. You, sin is coming short of the glory of God, the law. Once you break that law once, God calls you guilty of all of it. He's perfect. He's righteous. He's holy. He never sins, and he can't have a sinner in his presence. And I don't care if you went 50 years without breaking the law, which no one has. But even if you did, the moment you had that bad thought, that sinful thought in your heart, in your mind, you're guilty of it all. So why not get off the religious treadmill and trust the perfect one, the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm going to tell you, it's, it's, it's so refreshing to know, even when I sin, he's already forgiven me. I can just say, thank you, Father. And, and getting God's word through Paul and allow that doctrine to work and make me sin less. I'll sin less, okay? Now, go back to Galatians. As we come to the end of our study, Galatians chapter 5 again. Look at verse 4. Now, if you're going to be under performance, Paul says in verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever, you. whosoever of you are justified by the law, when you think law, just put PBA, performance-based acceptance. By the way, it's any law, not just the law of Moses. It's your law, my law, your standards, my standards. Anything that's contrary to what Paul says you ought to do, that's performance. Okay. 
Christ shall profit you nothing. He's become of no effect, verse 4. Justified. That word justified means to be declared righteous. You're saying, God, I'm going to be declared righteous before you by doing thus and so. And you give the list. You know, your church might have 12 things to make you right with God. The church down the street, that guy got 18 things. The other guy got 10 things. Now, I didn't try all the things, the 12 step, the 13 steps, whatever. It don't work. You're always going to fall short, so why not just trust Christ? A lot easier, right? Well, that's what Paul is saying. Look at verse 4. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law or performance to please God. Ye are fallen from grace. Now, we're going to end in this session with this term, fallen from grace, and pick up in the next session about it. But I want to tell you what falling from grace is not. Falling from grace is not losing your salvation. I'm going to say it again. Falling from grace is not losing your salvation. People think that. To fall from grace, that has to do with the operating principle that God has for you today. But once you've trusted the shed blood of Christ for your sins, that's eternal life. Now, how long is eternal? Eternity. Forever, right? When God gives you something... Paul says they're without repentance. He doesn't take it back. So once you get eternal life as a free gift, it's a gift, by the way. You don't pay for it. He paid for it with his precious blood, but he gives it to you freely. Once God gives you the free gift of eternal life, it's forever. So you can't lose your salvation, okay? And we'll look at some of that next week. But what falling from grace means, it means you do not have the power to live a life pleasing to God. No matter how hard you try on that religious treadmill, you go nowhere fast. That's why I call it a treadmill. You can run and sweat. You can run a marathon on a treadmill and go nowhere, right? Well, when you put yourself under performance-based acceptance instead of resting in Christ, that's what God sees. He says, you ran hard, but you went nowhere. See, to fall from grace means you have no power to please God in your own strength. You cannot manifest his life and his glory. See, God gave his son for you on the cross that he might give his son's life to you when you trust him. And then he'll live his life through you day by day when you walk in an understanding of what he wrote through the Apostle Paul in Romans through Philemon. To fall from grace means that the, the, the power in the word of God here, where the spirit of God is in Romans through Philemon, won't work in your life. You're saved. You'll never lose that, okay? But as far as your Christian life is concerned, you have no power to please God. You won't bring forth fruits that please God. Because you left the doctrine that he gave you to please him. So, how not to fall from grace? Well... If you want to make sure you don't fall from grace, Paul says, the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. When you study your Bible, when you're reading in Genesis through Acts, you need to know that's not speaking to me. When you're reading in Hebrews through Revelation, you need to take those verses and say, they're not speaking to me. When you're in Romans through Philemon, you say, that's speaking to me. And when you stick with what the Apostle Paul teaches, his doctrine, you'll never fall from grace, okay? Now, Paul just told us how to do it. Now, let me ask you. If you were to die today, does God, God has given his word because he loves you. He says he died on the cross to pay for your sins. That's him calling there, right? <laughs> That's all right. Our Lord Jesus Christ loves you, my friend, and he died to pay for your sins. And if you are saved, if you trust him by faith, you need to join us, okay? So join us next time.